to move on to the other, even more ambitious method of finding dark matter, which is to manufacture it from scratch. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of there out in the universe, but I don't need that. I can make my own in my lab. So here's my lab is Fermilab, which has what is currently the world's highest energy particle collider. Particle colliders are a way of manufacturing both ordinary matter and new kinds of matter. And I hope all of you have been out to Fermilab. If you have, you should make the trip. And the way you manufacture new kinds of matter is you go talk to this guy. He tells you that energy is convertible into matter. And therefore, if you have lots of energy, which you can get by accelerating ordinary particles, at the Fermilab we use protons and antiprotons, accelerate them so they have lots of kinetic energy, smash them together, that energy can be converted into new kinds of particles that don't normally exist on the Earth, like dark matter. In fact, we must produce those particles. If the laws of physics allow this to happen, and you have enough energy, and you keep banging things together long enough, you will produce all of these exotic particles allowed by nature, including the dark matter. So we're doing this at Fermilab. There is another laboratory called CERN, which is on the, in Geneva, on the French-Swiss border. They also have a particle accelerator, which is not quite working yet. Uh, but we'll be working, we hope, later this year. And it uh, blows us out of the water at Fermilab. It has almost 10 times the energy that we have at the Fermilab Tevatron. As you can see, well, this is again, this picture is a fake, like many of the pictures I'm showing you. That round uh, ring there is, is, was just drawn because the actual accelerator is underground. But it is 27 kilometers around. It's a, this is compared to the Geneva Airport, so you sort of get an idea of the size. It's an absolutely immense undertaking, uh, but it is now um, done, and they're just uh, getting a few bugs out of it, and it will be running later this year. So that's a lot of energy. You can imagine that you wouldn't bother to build a 27-kilometer accelerator unless you were going to get a lot of energy out of it. Uh, it is, in fact, a right in the energy regime where you should be able to make the kind of dark matter particles that we estimate from this, this set of wind arguments I was making. Uh, the dark matter should be. So we're very excited that either the Tevatron might get lucky in the next few years when it's running, but certainly the LHC should have plenty of energy to make these dark matter particles. <clears throat> now, as I said, the real experiment is underground, and it's not enough to have a huge accelerator. After you smash the proton, the, the LHC is protons and protons. So after you smash them together, you then have to figure out what happened. And so for that, we have experiments. And the two relevant experiments for the dark matter search are called CMS and ATLAS. They're on opposite ends, more or less, of this 27-kilometer ring. They're underground. They're absolutely huge things. There would be a session yesterday, which some of you might have attended, where the spokespeople of these experiments showed all of the amazing technology that went into these detectors. They're half a billion dollars each of electronics. To figure out what happens in these very high energy collisions, and as I'm going to show you, we're going to need all that information to figure out whether we made dark matter. Um, the one other point I wanted to make here is that although this is the largest science project uh, anyone has ever attempted, um, it is not the first time that there's been a huge construction project on this site. So this was built uh, between uh, Lake Geneva and the, the Jerome Mountains here in the Rhone Valley. Uh, as it turns out, in 58 BC, Julius Caesar built a wall between that lake and those set of mountains, which uh, unlike this project, which took 15 years, he did it in about six months. And the reason he did it was because in those days, the Swiss were a warlike people, and they were threatening to invade the Rhone Valley, which was a, a, a ally with Rome. And so to keep them out until he could get reinforcements, he had his, his poor uh, legionnaires, and I guess whoever else he could rope into it, uh, build a wall to all the way across this valley. And that was a good thing, in fact, for this area because uh, it led to a, a permanent Roman settlements there, which we then rediscovered when we were digging the holes for these uh, experiments. When they were digging the holes for the CMS experiment, they actually found the coins that are shown in the, in the lower left, uh, lower right there, um, from the ancient Roman days. So you know, some things never change. I guess. This is what it looks like underground. Uh, you're seeing here one of the bendy magnets that keeps the protons going around in the LHC. You also see the, uh, our uh, fire department, which has the world's skinniest fire trucks so that they can drive around the, this 27-kilometer road. 
to get around the ramp in case anything bad happens. We did actually have a bad thing that happened last September when uh, these magnets, uh, in order to bend, you might imagine that when you have the world's highest energy protons and you're trying to bend them around a ring, that you need a really powerful magnet. And indeed you do, you need uh, thousands of really powerful magnets. And the, the reason those magnets are really powerful, they're electromagnets, is they have a lot of uh, current flowing, flowing through them. The connections between these magnets uh, have about 10,000 amps of current. Um, somebody had to actually solder those connections. There's 10,000 of them. Uh, 9,999 of those connections were right on perfect. Uh, one of them was not. And, but that's the kind of thing when you try an experiment to this scale, uh, things like that will happen, you have to fix them. And, and that's why these you know, experiments take years. You don't just turn this thing on and have it work right. Here's uh, pictures of the Atlas and CMS detectors. The Atlas detectors is the one in the middle, the CMS detectors slice, uh, actually just a small slice of the CMS detector, the cover of Newsweek. Just to give you an idea of the size, uh, the Atlas detector is the world's largest particle detector. It weighs about 7,000 tons. CMS is slightly smaller, but it's also denser, and it weighs about 12,000 tons. And I've given you some other items that have similar weights. So these are absolutely huge things. And the reason they're huge is because these are not only very high energy collisions, so you need a big detector to contain everything that comes out, but they're also very complicated collisions. What comes out, we expect hundreds and hundreds of particles to come out in the collisions we're interested in. And we need to figure out what all of them were, what they were all doing, and reconstruct the, the entire collision to figure out what we made. So here's an explanation I got from the onion on how all of these detectors work. <laughs> Uh, it's pretty accurate. Uh, it does. It does light up. Uh, it does have sounds of thunder. Um, the only thing that wasn't true is that it doesn't have moving parts. But everything else is pretty much right. Um, another thing you may have heard that, that about the, this experiment is if you've read the book Angels and Demons, or the first part of that book takes place at CERN where he explains that uh, the Atlas experiment somehow manufactures antimatter, which it does, does not, it does not manufacture anything, it detects things. Uh, and if you read that book, you'll probably want to see the movie, which is coming out in May, starring these people, well, it's starring Tom Hanks, and this, uh, uh, she's a French actress, and uh, Ron Howard, uh, also known as Opie, is the director of this movie. They were just at CERN last week, uh, to see what the laboratory really looks like. It is absolutely nothing like what Dan Brown said it was. <laughs> <laughs> but they claim to be very impressed, and of course they asked where the antimatter was, and they were, they had to be told that it's, it's not like that. Although we do make antimatter. In fact, we make a lot more antimatter at Fermilab than we do than they do at CERN. We're, Fermilab is, in fact, the world's largest manufacturer of antimatter. And that leads me to my second homework problem, which is, uh, how much <laughs> and how long would it take Fermilab to produce that much energy? This is an easier problem than the first one. You can all do this. I don't even need to give an answer, but I'll give you the answer. Uh, you need to know this is just units. A kiloton. I, I assume a kiloton of TNT is enough to blow up the Vatican. It's probably more than enough. That's uh, 4.2 times 10 to 12 joules. Uh, e equals mc squared, but I get the matter for free. It matter. It, uh, and antimatter uh, destroy each other. So for every ounce of antimatter, I get uh, two mc squared all together. Um, and the answer, if you just know what the speed of light is, is that one kiloton of T TNT is the equivalent of having 0.1 grams of antimatter, which is not much. But it takes you a long time to produce this, because although we are the world's leading manufacturer of this will take this. Now, this is a funding dependent estimate, so it's <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I've told you what we're, we're not doing in these experiments. What are we actually doing? It's, it's very complicated, so I just want to give you a close with the flavor of this. Uh, this is a, a simulation of the Atlas detector, what a collision looks like in the Atlas detector. The beams are going into the screen, so protons going into the screen and coming out of the screen, colliding in the middle of that big circle there. And then as you see, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Each one of these uh, uh, red or yellow stripes are high energy particles that were produced from the collision and are coming out um, transverse, orthogonal to the beams. So they're 
point out in another direction. So the, the detector is supposed to figure out what all of those other high energy particles were, figure out their energy, their momentum, and, and to some extent, what kind of particles they were. Were they electrons, were they quarks, were they photons? And that's what these complicated detectors are designed to do. In the case of dark matter, dark matter is not gonna be any one of these red, yellow streaks, because the dark matter, as I said, interacts very weakly with ordinary matter. So even if you make it, you're not gonna see it in these detectors. The, the half a billion dollars you spend on these detectors is not enough to, to see dark matter directly. So we're actually going to find dark matter not by pointing to a track and saying there it is. We're gonna find it by seeing that there's something missing. This is what we call missing energy search. <coughs> missing energy, it's a little confusing because it's, it's really more of a missing momentum search. We're just looking for an imbalance in these kinds of collisions. And it's, it, this picture kind of looks like it has an imbalance. You see there, there ought to be as much momentum going out in these directions uh, orthogonal to the beam so that it all balances, since the beams didn't have any uh, transverse momentum, there ought to be, if I add up all that momentum from all these things coming out, it should add up to zero if I take the vector sum. And you can't really tell without measuring all, the, all, all these particles individually what, what's going on here, but we, what we expect is to have some events where there's a big imbalance, where there's, say, a whole bunch of stuff coming out, um, to, let's say, to the left, and nothing balancing it coming out to the right. So that's a very spectacular signature. It's something we know how to look for. It's something we have looked for. Um, the only problem with it is that just because you see something missing doesn't mean that it's dark matter. Uh, and the really tricky part here is how you convince yourself that the missing thing is dark matter rather than a couple of other things. So for example, as I said, neutrinos are very hard to detect. And we produce neutrinos in these collisions all the time. So neutrinos will produce missing energy and we have to figure out how to tell the difference between neutrinos and dark matter. The other thing is that whenever you screw up in these experiments, you produce missing energy. If, if, you're, if your whole detector wasn't turned on or wasn't functioning right, or you mismeasured something, uh, that's missing energy. So it's, it's a very complex uh, process to, to figure this all out. Fortunately, we have a lot of experience. So we're doing this at the LHC, but we've been doing it now for more than 10 years at the Tevatron. And we have shown that we can understand missing energy and understand not, we haven't seen any dark matter yet at the Tevatron, but we can show that we understand the missing energy that we see and that it's coming from neutrinos and problems with measuring things in the detector. Uh, I showed you this picture because in fact, uh, not only have we done this at the Tevatron, but at least two high school students that I know of actually work with real data from the Tevatron looking for dark matter particles in the form of supersymmetric particles. Uh, they, they didn't discover dark matter, but they actually, uh, you, by using real data, were able to say that a certain kind of supersymmetry model was ruled out, that you couldn't, you didn't see this at the Tevatron, so it wasn't the right explanation of dark matter. So this is a game that even high school students can play with, with a little help and with, of course, they have to be really smart and be really dedicated. We are now doing this uh, with the LHC experiment at CERN. These are not high school students, although to someone of my age, they look like high school students. These are actual PhD physicists. These are the people that are going to analyze the data at the LHC experiment, at, at least one of the experiments, CMS, um, to find dark matter in whatever form it has. So it's, it's important to realize that these experiments are actually done by young people. They're, the old people are doing sort of management positions and giving advice. Uh, but the real work of analyzing the data and figuring out the computer simulations that we're going to compare to the data is being done right now, and it's being done by a whole bunch of really smart, dedicated young people. These people are from all over the world. Uh, some of these people are Italian, uh, from Turkey, from there's uh, from one token American from Caltech, from Brazil. Uh, so it's, it's smart young people from all over the world that are actually going to make this. All right, and what they're doing is really complicated since we don't have the data yet, but they're running our simulations, and that's very important because the simulations are gonna tell us what it is we're looking for, and, and once we see some data, it's gonna tell us what kind of things we're looking at. So that gets me to the, the last uh, couple slides, which is what do we hope to learn from dark matter? Well, one of the things we wanna learn is why, why is there dark matter, and why is it stable? It's very unusual for matter to be stable. 
And in fact, the matter we know about is all stable because there's some kind of conserved charge that it has, and so they can't turn into something else without violating some conservation law. The simplest example of that is the electron. The electron is stable because it's the lightest particle that has electric charge. So it doesn't decay because that would violate the, con the, cons the conservation law of nature. So presumably that's true of dark matter, but we don't know what the conservation law is. Dark matter presumably carries some kind of new charge, some new conservation law of the laws of physics that we have no idea what it is. And that's the reason why it's stable. And this explains, for example, why particles that we know about aren't the dark matter. The Z boson, for example, is a weakly interacting massive particle. It was discovered in particle accelerators in the 1980s. Uh, it's heavy, and so it has all the properties to be a dark matter particle, but it's not stable. It decays through the ordinary forces of nature in about 0.3 octoseconds. You can look up what a octosecond is. <coughs> so it's very weird to have heavy particles that are stable like this. And the only way it can be is if there's some kind of new laws of nature that make these things stable. So we want to know what that is. We also want to know how dark matter is related to ordinary matter and how many kinds of dark matter there are. So here's an example. I mentioned supersymmetry a couple of times. This is Maybe not the answer, but it's a, one of the possibilities for what, why dark matter is there. Supersymmetry is, is an idea that goes back to, to very basic ideas about how quantum mechanics works. But the net result of this is that in supersymmetry, you predict that there's a, all the particles that we know about, the elementary particles which are shown on the left, have supersymmetric partners. There are other particles heavier than them, which are their partners under this new principle of nature called supersymmetry. And in fact, one of the exciting things about uh, this dark matter search is that several of these supersymmetric particles have the right properties to be the dark matter that we're looking for. Um, the supersymmetric partner of the photon, of the Z boson, and of the Higgs boson, or even mixtures of those things that could get all mixed up, have the right properties to be dark matter. So that may be what we're actually going to find, and then that would be great because then we're not just finding dark matter, but we're finding out how it's related to ordinary matter through supersymmetry. And also that there's a whole bunch of other unstable new particles that we can go look for at the same time, in addition to the dark. The other thing we'd like to find out once we have dark matter in the laboratory is what it tells us about the Big Bang. The dark matter was produced somehow. It may have been produced early in the Big Bang just by the fact that the Big Bang was hot. We call that thermal production. The Big Bang is very hot. It produced lots of particles, perhaps including the dark matter. Or it could be that the dark matter came from the decay of some other even more exotic objects in the early universe. So we'd like to figure that out. But more importantly, presumably the origin of dark matter happened very early in the universe because the dark matter particles are heavy things. It's hard to produce them once the universe cools off too much. So dark matter, once we have our hands on it in laboratory experiments, is going to be a window back to earlier parts of the Big Bang than we've been able to look at before by any other kinds of so it's not just the dark matter that's interesting. The dark matter itself may be telling us about the earliest moments of the Big Bang. OK, and then I just want to close with the idea that there may be big surprises here. We're talking about stuff that we haven't seen. Everything I told you could be wrong. And there could be some big surprises. I, I tend to favor the supersymmetry explanation of dark matter. But other people have made perfectly good uh, explanations of dark matter that involve extra dimensions of space. So maybe what real dark matter is really telling us is that there's extra dimensions of space. We won't know until we get our hands on it through these kinds of laboratory experiments. I think there's going to be surprises, uh, but what I began with and what I'll close with is that those surprises are going to happen pretty soon. Uh, we could have a discovery of dark matter as early as this year from the, something like CMS. The LHC could see dark matter evidence in the next two years, let's say, two, three years. Uh, and I think the, the story will then start to unwrap, start to uh, come together and unravel, will come together very rapidly. And within 10 years from now, we'll actually be able to tell you not just uh, a fantasy story, but the real story of what dark matter is, why it's there, where it came from. And who knows what we'll see. Thank you.